On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including SpaceX and Blue Origin moon landing updates, the Starbase water deluge system is under investigation, and the ULA announces a Christmas launch date for Vulcan. This is the Space Race. October 25th saw the start of the 2023 Von Braun Space Exploration Symposium, and with it, a conversation with NASA program managers about the planning and execution of the Artemis moon missions. Every aspect of the mission structure was touched on with the focus being on how the teams involved were approaching the execution of their individual parts, and at the very end, Dr. Lisa Watson Morgan spoke about the Human Landing System program. Watson Morgan is NASA's program manager for the crewed landing sections of the Artemis missions, which means that she and her team are responsible for organizing and liaising with both SpaceX and Blue Origin, as both companies ready their vehicles for the Artemis 3 and 5 missions respectively. Her section of the Artemis panel was devoted mostly to the nuts and bolts of procedure, the things NASA is doing to help SpaceX and Blue Origin develop their hardware, but more importantly, develop them on time. Because with an expected launch date of 2025 for Artemis 3, SpaceX at least doesn't have much time left to complete the mountain of testing needed before NASA will clear them to take a crew to the lunar surface. Obviously, the concern here is that SpaceX will have a more difficult time than anticipated with Starship's testing. Sure, they are more than ready for the second test flight, which is currently waiting on FAA approval to launch, more on that later, but proving Starship can fly is just one checkbox to tick out of hundreds. The HLS team is hoping for around 15 to 17 launches of Starship before the 2025 Artemis 3 launch date even happens, and that's because of the way NASA and its partners develop rockets. NASA has learned from working with SpaceX and other commercial partners that data is much more accurate if the team focuses on a smaller series of objectives per launch and just performs a lot of test launches. We've seen this with SpaceX for pretty much its entire history. Test, fly, learn, repeat must be tattooed on every one of their engineers by now. But while this sort of testing seems to be the safest way to develop the HLS hardware, it does present a problem for the overall schedule. Before 2025, SpaceX has to prove flight capability, recovery, operations, orbital insertion, zero-g refueling, docking with NASA's Orion capsule, long-duration flight, flammability test, cabin pressure stability, radiation shielding, landing stability, lunar takeoff, and probably a lot more we can't think of off the top of our heads. And this is where Watson Morgan gives us a little insight into NASA's take on this whole situation, because they don't seem particularly worried that Artemis 3 could be delayed. She was careful to say that NASA is concerned that the SpaceX testing could lag a bit, because the rest of the Artemis program really can't continue without success on Artemis 3. But we know that NASA has planned for delays in the overall program agenda, so it makes sense that Watson Morgan doesn't seem too nervous about potential delays, especially considering that NASA seems way more interested in the learning part of this exercise. Watson Morgan says that in addition to the highly visible flight tests, that gets a lot of attention, the development of tech, procedures, and supporting hardware that is being completed in the background will ensure that even if the worst should happen and Artemis 3 has to be cancelled or changed due to some unforeseen problem with Starship, the program will have gained so much valuable information and technology during the process that it would never be a total loss. And this includes Blue Origin, of course. On October 27th, Jeff Bezos' space launch company unveiled their own Blue Moon Mark I lander, the second commercial human landing system picked for the Artemis missions, specifically Artemis V, which is due to launch in September of 2029. The three-story tall white and gold lander has been in development since about 2016 and was a part of the original NASA contest that ended up awarding the first HLS contract to SpaceX. But since NASA likes using different providers to ensure redundancy, Blue Origin was picked for their second commercial lander mission. And as usual, the unveiling of their new lander came as a total surprise because Blue Origin doesn't keep the public up to date on their development cycles for better or for worse. 
The vehicle itself certainly looks like it's ready to fly, and the company says that it will be ready as soon as their new Glenn is in 2024. This means that Blue Origin has about five years of extra testing that SpaceX won't have, which is likely why Watson Morgan didn't mention them much in her lecture. She did point out that Blue Origin is using the same methods of testing as SpaceX is, though, taking all the help they can get from both NASA and Lockheed Martin, who have helped design their hardware. Blue Origin have said explicitly that their Mark 1 is a testing platform and will be helping the team test for Artemis 5 and design supporting technologies for that mission. It's a pretty clever method of designing, and it's a good thing NASA is adept at learning from their partners. Starship could still make their deadline for the current launch date of Artemis 3, but the team at NASA and SpaceX have made sure that it's not such a big deal if they don't, and of course anything that makes Starship stumble will be fixed in time for Blue Origin's turn. On October 22nd, SpaceX conducted a series of fuel and launch pad tests at their Boca Chica test center, and then again on the 24th, each test performed using a fully stacked Starship Super Heavy rocket to demonstrate full flight readiness. SpaceX has been diligently working towards recertifying their massive rocket for flight since their first test on April 20th went awry. But as repairs to the launch site have been completed and upgrades to the vehicle itself have been finished, the company seems very confident that they are ready to fly again. Both days of testing involved pumping cryogenic fuel into the stacked vehicle, with the operation on the 24th using over 10 million pounds of liquid oxygen and methane propellant to prove that Starship with its new hot staging collar could handle the procedure. But strangely, the more important test came at the end of testing on the 22nd as the team fired up Starbase's newly completed water deluge system, cranking it to full power with the aid of freshly installed high-pressure canisters and a final water tank. The eruption of water which will both cool the steel plate that sits directly under the booster's engines and protect from pressure and noise damage was much more powerful than the original tests back in July. But why would this be more important than fuel testing? Well, the answer to that came on October 25th when survey teams from the Fish and Wildlife Service were spotted on the grounds of Starbase. As we said earlier, SpaceX has been working closely with local and federal regulatory bodies to get their license for flight testing recertified. The biggest of these bodies is the Federal Aviation Administration, of course, but they formally closed the mishap investigation into the April 20th Starship explosion on September 8th, so their part seems to have been close to finishing. But the FAA wasn't the only regulatory body that SpaceX had to satisfy. So, while all of the mechanical requirements had been satisfied in September, the environmental concerns remained. This is where both the Fish and Wildlife Service comes in because the deluge system needs to be checked. There are a lot of environmental concerns with Starship that have already been accounted for and deemed safe. The pollution from its methane fuel, the potential fallout from an explosion, the debris from normal use, all that sort of thing. But when the deluge system pumps thousands of gallons of water into the coast of Boca Chica, water that has been shipped in and has a slightly different chemical and biological makeup to the local ecosystem, it's not likely to be an issue, but fish and wildlife still need to check it out, or they're not doing their jobs. The FAA says this part of the process could take up to 135 more days, though they were also quick to say that they don't believe it will take that long. And this sort of regulatory hang-up has been very frustrating for SpaceX lately, but also for the commercial space in general. Recent discussions going as far up the chain as Congress have centered around the need to update the regulatory system to account for the fact that the landscape of the space industry has changed dramatically in the last decade. We need a faster response time from these organizations. Now, of course, the companies themselves would like to see looser regulations in general, which would certainly speed up the process at the cost of potentially making spaceflight less safe, but other suggestions have centered around a need for more funding so that these bodies can more quickly do their work, or a single new regulatory body that can handle all aspects of licensing spaceflight operations without having to work between so many agencies like the FAA currently has to do. NASA is also on the side of regulatory reforms, throwing their weight behind creating a whole new regulatory framework that would cut through a lot of the unnecessary testing that currently bogs down the process. 
whatever the decision eventually ends up being, it looks like the external pressure to get Starship flying again is getting the environmental testing teams out in the field a little faster, and with any luck this sort of visibility will lead to Starship getting its license renewed before the end of this year. Just in time for Christmas, the United Launch Alliance has announced that their Vulcan rocket will have its very first launch on December 24th. Originally slated for a launch back in summer of this year, the ULA was plagued by mechanical issues with both their Centaur upper stage vehicle, the delayed development of the BE-4 engines made by Blue Origin for Vulcan's first stage booster, and the Peregrine Lunar Lander made by Astrobotic, and delayed more than once by the COVID pandemic. Needless to say, the ULA has had a pretty rough time getting their new rocket to the test stand, which is a real shame because on paper, the thing is very impressive. Vulcan's first stage is powered by a pair of BE-4 engines, which use a liquid methane and liquid oxygen fuel mix, just like SpaceX's Starship. The booster can produce 4,900 kilonewtons of maximum force, allowing the Vulcan to put up to 7,000 kilograms into geostationary orbit. That puts the Vulcan in competition with most other heavy lift rockets. Not Starship, but that's not a fair comparison really, considering that Starship outmasses Vulcan by a little under 10 times. Still, it's more than strong enough to allow the ULA's older workhorses, the Atlas V and Delta IV, to finally retire. The first flight won't just be a test of the Vulcan either, with Astrobotics Peregrine Moon Lander finally getting a chance to do what it was designed for and head to the lunar surface with a payload of NASA experiments. It certainly looks like the next several months are going to be very busy for the space race. Starship could get their launch license within the next three months, Blue Origin's New Shepard and New Glenn are looking at perhaps launching within the next several months too, and Vulcan of course has its Christmas launch, all while NASA prepares for a November 2024 launch. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real, and subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.